Lord, the Lord is at work in our midst. We know that. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful when we gather together and we feel his presence. Amen. Amen. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 21. We're going to pick up where we left off last week and, and, and conclude the story there. But we've, we've been taking a little journey. Uh, I've shared this, that oftentimes we do a, a journey through Christmas. And we'll start several weeks out and we'll preach messages leading up to Christmas. And then we move right on to the next thing. And sometimes we'll do a journey to Easter, journey to the resurrection. And, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll preach up to that point. And then the resurrection at the end. And, and yet the resurrection was the beginning. It, it was the, it's the beginning. It, it, it was the culmination of everything of God's plan, putting that together. But it, but it is with the resurrection that it all begins for us. And so we're going to continue with this, this series this morning of journey from the tomb. Instead of a journey to the tomb, we're going to do, we've been doing a little journey from the tomb and just looking at some things that have happened since that. And the title of the message today, I've, I, I've had a hard time nailing down a title, but this morning I actually changed it again. So Aaron, it's a good thing I didn't send it to you because it would have changed again. But, but the title this morning is just this. It's just, Now Follow Me. That's the title. Now, follow me. So we're going to be in John chapter one, uh, 21. We'll, we'll pick up on verse 12. We'll start right there, but uh, we'll, we'll just begin with introduction. So last week, we left Peter and the boys at the Sea of Tiberias, right? That's where we were. The sea, Peter and the guys were there at the, the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias. And uh, Peter had, had gone back to his comfort zone in the midst of the most turbulent, troubling, and uncomfortable time in his life. Peter had denied Jesus three times. Now, you can understand the, the, the turmoil that's going on in Peter's mind, in his heart, in his life right now. The Lord had been crucified and then the Lord was resurrected on the third day. We know that the Lord appeared to Peter personally on that first day and we assume that the Lord forgave Peter's failure for his, forgave his sin there. We don't know that. We, we, that, that, is, that is speculation. But it is said, the scriptures say, that he appeared to Peter. He had appeared to Peter and we, we kind of have figured the timeline on that. And if he appeared to Peter, we would assume that he dealt with the sin that Peter had committed and that was taken care of right there, okay? But Peter's in a place mentally, listen now, he's in a place mentally where he doesn't know what his place is now physically. And you can understand that. He's, he's had a fall. He's like, I, you know, I know where I'm at. I, I, know, I, 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 I know God's forgiven me, but he's, he's at a place where in his mind, in his spirit, he's troubled with, well, can I, can I still serve? He's forgiven, but is his ministry done? Can he possibly serve the Lord after what he did? What, he, what is he to do now? So he went back to what he knew, what he was comfortable with. He went back to fishing. He said, I go a fishing. And he let some others with him. And that's where we were last week. And, and, and we saw how God just blessed and they fished all night, didn't catch a thing. That's what happens when we try to do things in our own power. But when the Lord said, cast it on the other side, and they obeyed him, pulled in 153 fish. That was a, that was a, that was a, a great haul. To catch That would have been a great whole night, and they caught that in one time. That's God's blessing on it. Now, I want to ask you this morning as we begin this, uh, I want you to think about some things. Have you, have you, have you ever messed up? <laughs> think about this. Have you, ever, have you ever let someone down? Have you ever sinned? Have you ever failed the Lord? Have you ever hurt or disappointed someone? Maybe, maybe a spouse, maybe your children, maybe friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, the Lord himself. Now that's what you're, I want you to think about that. And so when we, when we do fail, because that's kind of a rhetorical question, right? I mean, preacher, come on. I mean, that was a dumb question, like, like we haven't. When we do fail, what is our greatest need after that fall? Or after that failure, or that mess up, or that letdown, or that stumble, what is our greatest need? Isn't it to be forgiven and the relationship restored? Isn't that the greatest need that we have? It really is. And, and we want to know that the person that we hurt or that, that we failed or that we let down, we want to know that they forgive us. And we want to know that it's all good and that the relationship is intact. You know, if, if we don't think that way, then if you don't think that way, you might be a narcissist, okay? That's just the bottom line. If you, if you hurt someone, you fail someone, you make the mistake, you stumble, 
and you're not concerned about that relationship, then, then you've got a heart problem, okay? And so that's what we want to look at today. So today, as, as I read this, as we read through this story, um, I need you to read it with me, and, and you got to see it, as I say often, you got to see it in color, okay? So as we read this this morning, you got to see it in color. you got to think about these people, Peter and these guys, and what they had been through and what they were going through at the time. So I need you to put on those funny-looking 3D glasses, okay? Those goofy little 3D-looking glasses, and, uh, and you need to watch this story and see it because I believe that this is one of the most powerful interactions recorded in all of Scripture. I really do. You know, we read through it. Here's the problem, though, is we read through this passage so fast and we come to conclusions about it too quickly. And I've heard this preached many times. And, there's, and we just, man, we just fly through this story. And this, this word is used and that word's not used. And, this word's, and, we, and we make this judgment on Peter. And, and I've never heard it really explained out the, the context of this conversation. So this morning, let's slow down and let's see what we can learn about our Savior from how he restores broken relationships, okay? So let's pray. Father, like Peter this morning, many of us, well, Lord, probably most, most of, well, really, Lord, all of us have failed you. Lord, and like Peter, we need restoration. Lord, I pray that you will teach us this morning. From your word, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John 21, verse 12, Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Now, I want you to, as we set the tone of this, you've got to get the picture because as they're coming on to shore, they don't say a word. They know it's the Lord, but they don't say, who are you? That's strange, right? The question. They knew it was the Lord, and yet the the thing is that they didn't say, who are you? So there was, I mean, they're still struggling with the fact that Jesus is alive, and they see him, and their eyes maybe, they're, they're dealing with this is Jesus, but is this Jesus? This, this, is, this is him. So the air is thick with the presence of the spiritual, amen? You ever felt that? You've been in service where the, 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 the presence of God was so thick you could just, you could feel it. The, the hair on your arm stands up as, as you feel it. That's what they're feeling. The presence of God is there and the presence of the spiritual and God is doing something in this. It, it's, it's, it, this is no ordinary day. This is no ordinary breakfast that they're about to take part in. Verse 13, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. Now, my question is this, how could, how could every single one of them not have had flashbacks to the night before the Lord was, was crucified, when the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper? Here he is again, breaking bread and giving it to them. Isn't this, can you imagine what's running through their minds? So now he's, he's set the tone. There's a fire there on the, on, the, on the beach. He's sitting there and he invites them. They come up and he breaks the bread and he gives it to them. And he breaks the fish, he, he, he distributes the fish to them. And they eat that. And, and so that, that, the, the night that the Lord, that's what they all had just done just a couple of weeks ago or a week ago or so. And uh, right there when the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper, he instituted communion. And it was the night that they had all made promises. I want you to hear this. They all made promises that they would soon break. Now, we, we, we go into this, we're thinking about Peter. Well, we know Peter failed him. But the fact is they all failed the Lord. He called them on it, and he, he's going to say that. So what must have been going through all of their minds? Have you ever had a situation? We've already said we have. You had a situation. There's some friction. There's some tension with somebody, and you know you need to have a conversation. There needs to be con- some confrontation, and confrontation is not always a bad word. Some of us love confrontation, right? And, and we like to be confrontational. That's not what the Lord's talking about. Confrontation is just confronting an issue. And and it can be a great thing if we handle it biblically. There needs to be confrontation. But they're about to have some confrontation with the risen, resurrected Lord who they've they've all let down. They've all betrayed. All of them. Can you imagine what's going through their minds? You can imagine the tension as they sit down on the beach and they're eating with the Lord. Verse 14. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he, uh, he was raised from the dead. Now, 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, 
All right, and we're going to stop right there because so when they had eaten breakfast, we don't hear about chit chat. We don't hear about small talk. They're not talking about the weather or who went hunting or, or you know, what, what new car they're buying or, you know, what are the Bulldogs going to do this year? Are they going to be any good? What's, what's going on? We don't see any of that. In fact, when you read that verse, so when they had eaten breakfast, it, it, this implies that there, wasn't, there was not much, if any, conversation at all. They sat there and they ate and their minds are racing. And they're scared to open their mouths and to even say, Jesus? They're scared. They're, 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 they're struggling at this point. They were grateful to be with the Lord on that beach, but at the same time, they may have been, uh, may have been so uncomfortable that they would have been glad to have been somewhere else, if not anywhere else. No one dared speak. So Jesus spoke. Continuing in verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter. Now listen, Jesus said to Simon Peter. That's the way it's recorded. To Simon Peter. He's talking to Peter here. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah. That's what he said. He didn't say Simon Peter. He didn't call him Cephas. He said, Simon, son of Jonah. So we look at how the Lord addressed Peter. He uses his old regenerate, as I would say, his BC name, his before Christ name. He uses that old name, that regenerate, unregenerate name, Simon. John chapter 1, verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. But the, the Cephas is Peter. That's the, that's the name there. Your name is Peter. You're going to be called Peter. You're a stone. You're a rock. Wow. We go, Lord, do you know Peter? You know, we, we see Peter and we think, man, he, he's, he's wishy-washy. He's got a big mouth. He's very impetuous. You know, I relate to Peter a lot of times. I understand. And, but, but here's the thing. When he said that, you have to imagine that had to hurt Peter. It hurt him. He just called me Simon. He's the one who said, I'll be Cephas now. I'm Peter. I'm, I'm Rock. Man, he's, he didn't call me that. It had to have hurt Peter. But I believe this. I believe that that hurt, that cut, is intentional and it's loving. And here's why. See, Jesus wants Peter to remember the seriousness of his failure and recognize where it came from. It came from his own flesh and it came from his old nature. That's where it came from. And that's where our failures come from as well, our old nature the old man, when we fail to walk in the spirit, when we don't walk in the spirit, what do we do? We walk in the flesh. And when we walk in the flesh, guess what we do? We fall, we fail, we miss the mark again and again and again. Minimizing the seriousness of our sins and, and, and concealing the source does not help in the healing of a guilty conscience. When we fail and we're feeling bad about it, the, 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 the last thing the Lord's going to do is say, hey, it's no big deal. Ah, forget about it. No big deal. No, no, no. The Lord doesn't deal that way. So here's the deal. Don't minimize the offense when we sin. You know, we want to call it something else or we want to excuse it because of this, that, or the other or we want to blame it on someone else. Satan, you know, Satan made me do it. Satan can't make you do anything. Satan can't make you do a thing. No one else can be blamed for your sin but you. And when we sin, we need to call it what it is. Don't minimize the offense of sin. And don't ignore where it comes from. It comes from our old nature. It comes from our flesh. No doubt the Lord had all of Peter's attention the moment he spoke to him. But even more so when he addressed him as he did. Simon. If Peter had not thought about it before this moment, he surely thought about it now. Think about it. The fire and the coals are burning. And that surely brought back memories of the fires he warmed himself by as he three times denied knowing the Lord Jesus. The echoes of the rooster crowing must have still been ringing in his ears. Then Jesus looks at him with those eyes. The same unblinking, guiltless, omniscient eyes that looked into Peter's heart on that terrible night. Peter had gone out and, and wept bitterly, but his tears couldn't wash that image from his mind. He would never forget what he had done. And now those same eyes are looking at him again. See it. You got to see it. You, you got to see this in color. You got you to just think with Peter the anguish, folks, that, that is this moment. 
He is, his heart is heavy. He is, he's by fire. He denied the Lord three times by the fire. He's, the, the Lord, after the, the rooster crowed, the Lord looked at him right at him, saw right to his heart, and it just broke Peter. As he looks at him now, Peter's broken. The anguish, the, what he must be feeling. And I believe the setting is not accidental, but it's very intentional. All designed to fully engage Peter's memory. See, the Lord wants us mindful of who we are. When he deals with us, he wants us mindful of who we are. He wants to deal with us about the, 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 if he's dealing about something we've made a mistake in, he wants us to be mindful of that mistake, that failure, that sin. He doesn't want us thinking about the high times. Oh, man, the high, that was great. Man, that was at my best there. Worship was good. No, no, he wants us to go back and remember that sin when he's dealing with us. He wants us mindful of who we are and where we are spiritually. He wants to know where we are. He wants us to know where we are when he's dealing with us. And, folks, he does not deal in generalities. No. He deals with us very specifically. When he says confess sin... He means confess sin, the sin, name it, call it. Don't say, Lord, Lord, I, I, I've messed up this week. I, I've made some mistakes. Please forgive me. Really? Well, well, what mistake? You know, he asks questions a lot, right? So, so what, 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 what sins? I, I can see him almost playing ignorant, like, right, Randy? What, what sins you talking about, Randy? Well, you know, Lord, you know, Monday I had a Monday, huh? Monday, you remember Monday. So Monday, sins on Monday, huh? Well, what, what sin was that on Monday, Randy? Well, Lord, it was just something I, I thought. I had a, an impure thought. Well, Randy, that's, that's interesting. You had an impure thought. What was that thought, Randy? You get it? The Lord wants specifics. He wants us to name it. This is the only time I'll say this, name it and claim it, Okay. <laughs> This is it. Name it. Name your sin. Claim your sin. Don't ignore your sin. Don't, don't act like you didn't sin. Because we do. And he wants us to be specific with it. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah. Now he, said, he continues with his question. Do you love me more than these? Now the word for love that the Lord uses here is the word agape. You know that word, agape. It's the word for the highest kind of love. And the word, the word used for God's love. Love that is lofty, spiritual, and pure. Okay, so that's what he says. He says, he says Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape love me? Do you love me with the highest kind of love? With the God kind of love? And do you love me with that love more than these? Now there's some... There's some there's some question about what does that mean, the more than these. There's a lot of debate about that. And some would tell you that, that, that the Lord's asking him, Peter, do you love me more than you love these disciples? It doesn't seem that there's any validity to that. Well, no, never did they argue about how much they loved each other. Never was there question about whether they loved each other more. Did, that, did John love Peter more than he loved Jesus? There was never any argument about that. It doesn't seem to hold water. The second, the second speculation is this. Uh, do you love me more than you love these boats and nets and fish? Now, there's some, there's some reason to think there's some validity to that. He had been a fisherman. He, what did he do now? He went back to fishing. He went back to what he knew. Maybe he loved it. But the Lord wants to get to that. I don't, I don't, but see, I don't believe that's the question he's asking either. Peter didn't really give indication that I'm going back to fishing forever. I'm done with ministry. I'm done with this stuff. I failed. I'm disqualified. I'm out. I'm going fishing, and I'm not coming back. He didn't indicate that. He just said, I'm going fishing. So the third option, and most likely the meaning is this. Simon, do you love me more than these other disciples? Love me. And that seems to be the meaning of this question. Peter, you've, you've said you love me. You've claimed it. Certainly that was what Peter had boasted. If you know, the, if you know Peter and you know the, the scriptures, in Matthew 26, verse 31, then Jesus said to them, listen, he said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. All of you. So how many of them do you think stumbled? All of them. The Lord's never wrong. He said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the fold will be scattered. Now, you understand Peter is, he's a leader in that group. There's a, there's a different, 
We all can make mistakes, but there's a higher standard when a leader falls. There's a greater effect on others. You know, there, there are folks that can have an, they, they can commit adultery and, and it can be kept quiet. It doesn't resonate. Nobody knows about it and all that kind of stuff. But if a pastor fails in that way, it affects everybody. It affects the whole community. So you, there, there's a difference, okay, in, in, in the consequences of these falls. And it's not individually, it's all just as, as great because we're sinning against the Lord. But they're all going to betray him. And they all do. They, 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 they stumble and they, and, they, and they leave and they abandon him. Verse 32, but after I have, I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. That's where they're at. Verse 33, Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you. Now listen, this is Peter. This is boastful Peter. Even if all are made to stumble because of you, Lord, I will never be made to stumble. I, I, I just thought, Boy, the verse that pops in my mind, pride goeth before the fall. Amen. Verse 34, Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, oh, oh, Peter, oh, you, okay, Peter, you're, you'll never fail me, huh? I say, assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter didn't even flinch. It wasn't like he went, whoa, Lord, I can't believe you'd say that. No, no, no. What's he do? He doubles down. Verse 35, Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said, but now we get on to Peter. The rest of the verse says, and so said all the disciples. They all agreed with that. We'll all die with you, Lord. We'll all, we're, we'll never deny you. We'll never. Peter was very bold in his denial. There, there's more than a hint in these statements that Peter believed he loved the Lord more than the other disciples did. There's a hint of that. We, we hear that. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Peter had the greatest love. He loved the Lord many, more than any of the others did, or at least that was his boasting. Because no greater love had, had anyone to lay down his life for his friend. Lord, I'll die for you. None of these guys have a greater love than I have for you, Lord, because I would die for you. That's the greatest love. So he, Peter, then said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter used the word phileo here. Jesus had asked him, do you agape me? Do you love me with this greatest love? And Peter uses the word phileo for love. And that's a word that means brotherly love or a deep affection. And so what Peter said was, yes, Lord, I have a deep affection for you. Now, this is not, understand, the phileo love is not a, it's not like a flippant love. This is a deep, this is truly a deep and, and an affectionate love. And, and the first thing you need to notice, because people jump on Peter and they go, well, he's, he's saying he doesn't really love the Lord. That's not what he said at all. What did he, the Lord said, do you agape love me? He said, yes, Lord. He affirms his love for the Lord. But he said, you know. Now, Lord, you know. You know, Lord. You know that I have a deep affection for you. Now, we have to be careful not to be too harsh in our judgment of Peter in this answer. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 says this, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Now, let any man love, if any man love not the Lord. You, you would think maybe that's agape love right there. It's not agape love. It's phileo. And so what the Lord has told us, what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians, if any man does not deeply love, a, a deep affection for the Lord, this, this phileo love, the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. And so it appears here that the Lord accepted Peter's genuine profession of his love. This could have ended right here, but it didn't. And the Lord's making, again, a very intentional point as he goes through this. But this could have ended right here. Jesus, uh, Jesus said to him, now he says, feed my lambs. So Jesus affirmed Peter's calling with this simple statement to feed my lambs. Now the word feed is this word, it's bosco. And it means provide food for my little lambs. The word there for lambs, it means the little bitty ones, the little babies, those who can't care for themselves. They need to be fed. They need to be taken care of so that they can grow up. But it, he says this word bosco, it means to feed, to provide for. So provide food for my little lambs. Jesus once and for all directed Peter away from the secular and to the spiritual, from, from the fishing business and back into the catching business and the shepherding of God's lamb business. 
Now, what we see here is restoration. That's restoration right there. And, and this, as I just said, this could, this could have been it. The Lord could have said, he could have said what he's going to say a little later. He could have said it right here and it would have had the same, it would have had, meant the same thing and done the same thing. But I want you to see the point of, of what the Lord is doing here. Verse 16, he said, the Lord, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, still using the same name, do you love me? And again, the Lord uses the word agape. So do you have this agape love for me? And now the Lord isn't asking Peter if, if Peter loves him more than, than the others love him. No, he's asking Peter. He says, Simon, do you love me? I'm not, he doesn't want to compare his love. I don't want to know, do you love me more than somebody else loves me? I want to know, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Absolutely. And he, Peter said again, yes, Lord. He answers in the affirmative. Yes, Lord, I love you. And he says, you know, again, he knows the Lord knows. He says, you know that I phileo you. It's the same word. I have this deep affection for you, Lord. And so Jesus says, he says to him, tend my sheep. It's a different, there's a different word there. This word tend is the word poi, poi ma eo, um, eno, poi ma eno. And it means to tend or to shepherd or to rule. That's the idea here. So the word for sheep is this, the word probadia, and it's mature sheep. So he said over here, you need to feed my little bitty lambs. You need to take care of them. Little ones, feed them. Now he says these older sheep, these more mature sheep, you need to lead them. You need to, you need to shepherd them and guide them and rule them. Lambs need to be fed and sheep need to be uh, led. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? But there's an interesting change here because now this time Jesus uses the word for love that Peter has now used twice. And so he says, Simon, do you truly have a deep affection for me? It's almost as though, all right, you don't have a agape love. You've said that. You've said that. You, you, you've, you've said you have this deep affection for me. Now I'm just going to ask you straight up. Do you really have this deep affection for me? Does God know? Does God know? He knew before he asked him. Jesus knows. He knows Peter's heart. This is all intentional and we want to see this. Do you have this? Do you have a deep affection for me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? This third question hurt him. It grieved him. Man, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. And so here's what he says, Lord, you know. He didn't just say, Lord, you know I love you. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know all things, Lord. You know everything. You know my heart. You know that I love you. You know. Lord, you know it. You're not guessing. I'm not giving you the answer you don't know. You know that I have a deep affection for you. The three questions matched the three denials. Three different times Peter denied the Lord. And now three times he has Peter affirm his love. Peter was vehement when he denied the Lord the third time. If you go back and read that story, I mean, he, he uses language he shouldn't use. He got hot about it. I don't know him. I have no part of that. He's, he's passionate here. He's passionate here. Perhaps the Lord's stirring up his passion a little bit. Perhaps he, he wants to get him out of this passive uh, pity party and get him passionate again about his love for the Lord. You know I have a, a, a deep affection for you. You know me through and through. You know everything. You know what I said. You know what I did. And you know what I am. You know me better than I know myself. Lord, out of all your knowledge of, of me, you know I have a deep affection for you. You know I love you. Listen, phileo. And I know I can never love you the way you love me, agape. What a great confession that is. No longer is Peter boasting about, yes, Lord, I agape love you. I've got the greatest love in the world for you. I have a God-like love for you. Peter, Peter's very humbled here. And folks, this is the confession of a broken man, aware of his weaknesses, sensitive to his limitations, and afraid ever to boast again. And isn't that the place we need to be before the Lord? 
That's where we need to be. See, we need to be broken. We need to be aware of our weaknesses. We need to be sensitive of our own limitations. And we ought to be afraid to boast anything about our relationship with the Lord that's not true. Man, that's where God wants us to be this morning. Jesus said to him now this third time, a third commission, he said, feed my sheep. And this time he goes back to that word bosco, and it's the word for feed. So the sheep need not only to be led, but they also need to be fed. Feed my lambs. Shepherd the flock. Feed my sheep. There's a threefold uh, commission that he's given Peter here. So Peter's installed into the office as an under-shepherd of the Lord. He's fully aware, listen now, he's fully aware and fully affirmed in his calling to tend God's flock. The flock of God needs two things. It needs to be fed well and needs to be led well. That's what, that's what a flock needs. That's what every church needs is to be fed well and led well. Now, folks, while it is true that the Holy Spirit equips men to serve as shepherds and gives these men to churches, we know that from Ephesians chapter 4, it's also true that, it, that each individual Christian must, must help in the care of the flock. And you go, well, what does that mean, preacher? Well, you're the shepherd, and Raymond's a shepherd, and John's a shepherd. You're the, you're the elders of this church, you're, you're, and, 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 and Pastor Aaron is a, is a, a shepherd. He's a, he's a pastor here. He's to oversee and, 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 and guard us and to teach us and point us in the right direction. They're, 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 you guys are to care for the flock. That's what you're to do. Well, we do. And we, have very specific, we have very specific job descriptions in what we're to do as shepherds, as elders, as pastors and overseers. But listen, each of us has a gift or gifts from the Lord, and we should use what he has given us to, listen, to protect the flock and to perfect the flock. So if you think, well, I'm a part of this, but I don't have any, I don't have any responsibility, you are wrong. Because you, every, every person in here is a believer, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to help protect the flock. We've got to look out for each other. Anybody in here doesn't need a wingman? You know, I don't know what that is. What's a wingman? Well, when you fly an airplane, raise your hand, pilots. Do y'all have blind spots when you fly an airplane? It's nice to have somebody that can see your blind spots. They can see your wing. They can see areas you can't see. You want somebody flying out there that's looking out for you. That's what we have to be for each other. We are to protect each other. When you see things that men, you go, you know what? You don't need that in your life. You're heading down the wrong road. Well, they might get mad at me. Yeah, they might, but does that matter more to you than if they do go down the wrong road? At least if they go down the wrong road, you've told them and they've heard it and they know. Help protect the flock and help perfect the flock. Sheep are prone to wonder and we, we must look after each other and encourage one another. Amen? Verse 18 and 19, the Lord gives here, he gives Peter a little insight into the future. I tried to think if I'm Peter, I'd be like, Lord, I wish you hadn't told me that. But, but he does. Verse 18 says, Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, well, there's some good news there. Peter knows he's going to live a longer life. It's when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you to where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. Now there's some, there's, some, there's some good news in that. Even Peter's death was going to bring glory to God. Man, we want to bring glory to God, amen? That's what our life is about. My life is to bring glory to God. That's what I want my life to do. And so God gives him that. And when he had spoken this, here's what he said to Peter. Follow me. He says, Peter, now follow me. I've, I've, we've dealt with this. You're reinstated. You're, you're, you've been reconciled. You've been restored. Your calling is secure. Follow me. Follow me, Peter. Be done with this. You've reaffirmed your love for me. You're passionate about that now. Follow me. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Drop down to verse 21 there in John 14. He says, he, uh, he who has my commandments and keeps them is, is he who loves me. 
And he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Boy, the Lord could ask us this morning, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I'm, I, I have a deep affection for you. You do? Then follow me. Then obey my commands. The, the word, the words that I've given you, obey the word that I've given you. Because you say you love me, you speak that with your mouth, but your life doesn't live it. He says, follow me. The restoration was complete and the others had witnessed it. Peter's denials happened before a fire. Now Peter's confessions were before a fire. There were three denials and now three confessions as well as three gracious commissions. The Lord was restoring Peter, but he's also teaching us about restoration and about the needed supremacy of our love for God. Here was a man that loved God with all of his heart, but he needed to be affirmed in that love before he could again serve fruitfully. Do you get that? Peter loved the Lord. Don't question for one second whether Peter loved the Lord or not. He had a great love for the Lord, a deep love for the Lord. And the only reason he didn't use the word agape is because he wasn't going to make some boastful statement at this point. He was done with that. I'm just going to tell you how it is, Lord. I have a deep affection for you. I'm not promising anything beyond that. I'm not going to be boastful in what I say in my profession for you. But he needed to be affirmed. He had failed. He had made a mistake. He had tripped up. Anybody been there? Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you need to be affirmed from the Lord. You need to reaffirm your love for the Lord. See, some of us love the Lord and others may not. But the abiding principle is that before all things, even service to God, we must love God with all our heart. This is what that whole conversation was about. Peter's love for the Lord. Do you love me? Then follow me. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? Tend my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Then feed the sheep. Do what I've called you to do. Do what I've led you to do. Obey my words. Follow me. So the highest priority in life is that we love the Lord. Luke 10, 27. So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. I think that covers it all. And that's how we're to love the Lord, folks. Now, there's a, there's a, a, a quote that I've, I've, I've shared it before, and it, it's something typically at the start of the year, it really is a part of, of, you know, I don't make New Year's resolutions, but I try to make some commitments, but I try to think about the year coming up. And this is, this is what I think. Lord, don't, don't allow me to get so caught up in the work of the Lord that I neglect the Lord of the work. You know what? We can be busy, 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 busy about the Lord's work and not really be loving the Lord. We can be busy about doing for the Lord when we're not being with the Lord. We can be about telling others about the Lord and we're spending no time with the Lord. That's what the Lord wants. He wants our relationship with Him. He wants that preeminent to anything else. He wants our love for him. And everything else goes out of that. God wants us reconciled to him. Amen? Salvation. He wants us to be reconciled. But if we fail and we do fail, then he wants us reconciled and he wants us restored. He wants to restore us in that. He wants us to feed his sheep. And what he means by that is to serve. We're all saved to serve. If you're saved, you're saved to serve. An unserving Christian, that's a contradiction. That's like saying, I'm forgiven, but I won't forgive. It's a contradiction. But first and most importantly, whether we serve or not, but the most important thing is he wants us to truly love him before we set out to serve him. I'm telling you something, maybe this morning, there might be somebody here who goes, you know what, I'm, 
my heart ain't right with God. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not spending time. I don't love God. I'm not loving him with my life. There's nothing in my life that shows that. Maybe I need to step back for a season and get my heart right with God before I start trying to serve for the Lord. Well, that's a weird thing to say, preacher. We need people to serve. Don't ask people not to serve. I don't care whether you serve or not if your heart's not right with God. Now, I, I'd rather you not. I'd rather you get your heart right with Him and you serve out of a heart of love for Him and obedience to Him. Don't let that be another excuse or, or distraction from where he wants you to be with him. Amen? Amen? He also wants us to be advocates for reconciliation and restoration of others so through, through salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.18 Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. All right, he reconciled us to, to God. And, and the Lord has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Our ministry is to go out and bring lost sinners to Jesus. Well, we can't save anybody, but we can get them to Jesus and he can save them. Amen? Amen? That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Great verses right there. We are to be evangelists. We are to be about the work of reconciling, being reconcilers. Our job is to go out and bring lost sinners to Jesus. Can't save them, can't can't convict them, can't change their minds. I can't do anything, but I can do exactly what God told me to do, and that is to tell them. That is your only job, and it is our job, believer, to tell them. We're to reconcile the lost world, but we're also to reconcile believers who fall. Galatians 6.1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, that may be the problem, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Boy, did the Lord not come to those men on that beach gently? He fed them. He let them get dried off. He let them get warm by the fire before he dealt with a very difficult conversation. And he did it very gently, very lovingly, very much in their face. But he did it very gently and lovingly. Folks, that's what we need to do. Now, what's the, what's, the, what's the purpose of church discipline? Get them out of church. Get them out of here. That's not the purpose of church discipline. What's the, absolutely. Restoration. The purpose of church discipline is that we, we deal with the problem. You know, when Matthew 18, if I got a problem with Brent, I need to go to Brent. If Brent's got a problem with me, he needs to come to me. And, and, and we need to, and if we're both trying to come together and get it right, you know, it's amazing how easy that is. Brother, we, what ends up is we're both going, I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean, I'm sorry too, man. I shouldn't have got mad about that. Well, I shouldn't have said it. I was worse than that. Yeah, but I shouldn't have got mad. I should have just let it go. It shouldn't have been an issue, but it was. And so if it's an issue, we need to deal with it. But let's say he, he sinned or there's something going on. There's sin in his life. Then, then, and I go to him and he says, man, mind your own business. Well, this is my business. This is part of the family. This is family business. And you're walking in sin right now and you're not repentant. So I'm going to go get two others and we're going to go and talk to him again. And now if he won't repent of that, that's when we come before the church. And when we come before the church and he won't repent, then what we do is we vote him out of the church. Boy, that's harsh, preacher. Well, take it up with God. That's what he said to do. And why did he say to do that? So that he then is out for un, under, under the protection, God's hand of protection there, and, and that his soul might be spared and get him out of that sin and get him back right with God so he gets back into the church forgiven and reconciled and restored. Amen. Now I'll say this. If I fall in, in, in adultery, there are certain sins that if, if a man in ministry falls in, I'm not going to be in this pulpit again. There are some that go and fill the pulpit again, and they're wrong. They're wrong. Restoration doesn't mean... Listen, Adam and Eve were forgiven of their sin. Amen? They never went back in the garden. Y'all understand that, right? 
So there, there, there are things, there are certain positions that when you fail in, you're disqualified from that. But would that mean I could never serve God again? Doesn't mean that at all. It just means I can't serve in this capacity. Amen? Amen. So, folks, what we, the whole purpose of that, of church discipline, of us having these conversations, is reconciliation. So that we're then restored. Has the Lord brought something to mind? I'm going to ask Jim. Jim, I'm going to ask you to come. Pastor, if you'll just... Jim's going to play you this morning here in a moment. We're going to have an invitation. He's just going to play. And we're, going to have, we're, just going to, we're just going to have a... a, a I want us to have an, an attitude of prayer this morning. I don't even want you... We're not going to stand up. We're not going to sing. I want you to sit and I want you... We're going to have an attitude of prayer. And the altar is going to be open this morning. I've shared with you often now, we understand this. this is, these are not steps up here. They look like steps, but they're not steps. Because right now, this is an altar. And this is a place for us to do business with God about what He's doing business with us. If He's dealing with us, we need to deal with Him. And I encourage you, come to the altar and deal with Him. Has the Lord brought something to mind that you need to confess? Whether it be with Him or a brother or sister. Do you need reconciliation with the Lord that would lead to restoration in service? Perhaps you're going, you know, I just don't feel like the, the, God's hands on me as I serve now. Have you, got a, have you got sin in your life? Have you got something you're holding on to? You're not letting go. You're not, you haven't confessed it. You ain't repented of it. You haven't turned away from it. You're still walking in it. Are you walking at a guilty distance from the Lord? And yet you want His blessing on your life? It's not how the Lord works. Do you need some rec reconciliation? Do you need forgiveness this morning? Do you need reconciliation? Do you need restoration? Maybe you've fallen and you aren't sure that you can still serve the Lord. Let me assure you, you get it right with God, whatever it is. He wants to reconcile with you. He wants to restore you. And He wants you to follow Him in doing what He's called you and created you to do. Don't think because I've messed up, He's done with me. He wants to restore you. But first you have to reconcile with him and to, and to be reconciled you have to confess whatever sin stands between you and him. Now, this may be, that sounds like, well preacher, that's just all bad. That sounds like it's all bad stuff. In my, ain't none of that bad. We're all, we've all been there or are there or going to be there. And so this morning is just an opportunity for you to just deal with God about whatever it is he's dealing with you about. And maybe today is today would just be a great day to reaffirm our love for the Lord before we take one more step doing anything else. Today would be a good day just to reaffirm that love. We ought to be at the altar this morning. We're not going to stand. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. We're going to have prayer here in just a moment. If God's dealing with your heart this morning... Uh, I encourage you, come down and pray. If you want somebody to pray with you, we'd love to pray with you this morning. We'll grab somebody and pray with you. This morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and, and I ask that that way because if you don't know Him as your Savior, you, you know that you don't know Him as your Savior. Perhaps right now your heart's pounding. You're going, I hear what you're talking about, but I've never been saved. I don't even know what being saved means. I don't know what it means to be born again. What it means is this, is that you're separated from God by your sin. And there's nothing that you can do about it. And because God loved us so much, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who came, who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, who went to the cross of Calvary. And on that cross, He took your place. He took your death sentence for your sin. He bore your sin on that cross. He paid that debt we could not pay, and He died in our place. And three days later, He rose from the dead. And He offers us forgiveness of sin and eternal life if we'll simply confess our sin, repent and turn from it and, and believe by faith in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I plead with you. I plead with you as though God were pleading for, with you right now. Come to Him. Give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Him. Whatever he's dealing with you about this morning, deal with him. Jim, uh, Jim, I'm sorry, just a second. Father, 
Thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you'll, you'll use what you have prepared in me this morning. Lord, I, I, I pray folks didn't hear me. I pray they've heard from you. I pray they heard things I didn't even say. And I pray they didn't hear the things I shouldn't have said. But God, they just simply, they've heard from you. And right now, Lord, as we come to this time of, of responding to what you've done and what you're doing, Lord, but may we truly be obedient to respond to you in whatever it is you're dealing with us about this morning. God, would you move among us now and, and, and give us the courage to step out or to come to the altar and just to have a time of praying, confessing, reconciling, being restored, Lord, to, 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 or just to reaffirm our love for you. God, move now in our midst and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. We pray.